Today's cultural beauty of Japan is the Japanese yukata. And um, I'm wearing mine that I had uh, bought in Kyoto uh, in Japan. And this is a resist dye. It's um, on the indigo uh, cotton. And of course you see a lot of blue and white because blue and white are very refreshing for summer. And it's, a, it's all about wearing a cotton yukata. Uh, you don't have to wear all the layers. You don't have to wear all the neck pieces with it. Uh, you kind of wear it a little looser at the neck. And I'll read about that, but I want to pass around this book. It's uh, when you have when you're a foreigner, English speaker, and you go to Japan. They have these cute little cartoon books that kind of help you with the, with uh, navigating the culture um, of your culture versus the Japanese culture. And I'll just show you that um, on in this little book, it shows how not to wear your yukata, and that you are to wear your yukata. Uh, closed and very tidy and not loosely opened like that. But I'm going to have you uh, pass that around so you can see that. And then I'm going to read about the yukata. So, yukatas are worn at festivals for a stroll on a summer evening or for shopping. Although you don't have to wear, you can wear a cotton, uh, uh, like a slip or an undergarment underneath. Um, it, uh, the length of the hem is used and the sleeves are usually shorter uh, to give a cool impression. Yukata are worn rather loose at the neck, but because the cloth wrinkles easily, looking well dressed in one is not as simple as it may seem. It is better not to carry a handbag. Instead, put the purse or other necessary things in the front part of the obi. So you would tuck your, uh, your little purse, your flat little bag right here with your fan or whatever right behind the obi. But if you need a purse, you should have one made of bamboo or palm or something that looks more summertime, summer-like. Uh, the obi, uh, that's if the obi is too narrow to, to hold your, your wallet there or your purse. Um, the other thing is you always wear um, your, you would starch it actually. I didn't have time to starch mine, but I would have ironed and pressed and starched it and that's what would make it look comfortable and cool. And then I don't really manicure my toes or my nails, so sumimasen and gomen nasai. But I am actually modeling, these are men's gaitas. And you would wear outside, these gaitas are wooden. You can see they're, they're like little thongs, right? But they've got the wooden part at the bottom and you only wear them outside. A men's one has a square toe and a woman's has a rounded toe. But I have bigger feet, so I have to wear these. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have an old fashioned uh, little note from a book about Japanese footwear. Japanese footgear attracts the immediate attention of foreign visitors uh, particularly due to the thick clack of the geita on the pavement. The most distinctive feature of Japanese footwear is the Y-shaped cord or the thong which passes between the big toe and the second toe. And it is a constant feature since there is a great variety in Japanese footwear itself. All kinds, however, are roughly divided into two main classes. For hard outdoor wear, there's the geita like this, and then there's the zori, which is like this one, or like this one that Lynn brought, and I will have to talk about that in a minute. Okay, so there's another seat that with the bamboo or the little palm. Isn't that beautiful? Anyway, so the, this is a lacquered wood one. All right, now I'm gonna come back here. I used to love to, when I lived in Japan, um, every season I would go out and buy the expensive um, kimono quarterly magazines. And this is a summer version, and the inside is, uh, are some beautiful pictures of some yukata uh, for the summertime to wear. So you would wear an obi and then you would, uh, you would tie it in the front and slide it around and then you put your bow or your little accent in that. But men also wear a yukata and you can see in the pictures that I have up here and also my husband's is the first sample with his sash, with his obi. The second one is my, was my mother-in-law's with flowers on it. The third one with the dragons was my father-in-law's and the last one was my mother's. And she had shortened it to wear it as a robe. So um, the yukata is very, just very nice and comfortable. And I do wear mine when I go on vacation. I'll pack it and take it with me when I go uh, travel. Because it rolls up really small, flat, because it's cotton, and it's comfortable and I love it.
Um, a neighbor of mine bought, uh, sent us this little folk art scene of a summer festival. Now the people in the picture, or in the diorama, uh, don't have on the yukata, but they have on more formal kimono. So even though I think this is a summer scene with the little umbrella and the little festival things, it's still, this is the month for children's day or boys day it was uh, the fifth month, the fifth day. So we're past that, but I thought I'd just bring that to give you a little inspiration. So Lynn, would you like to share about your little, your little um, Zori shoes? I can tell you a little bit. Um, these are Zodi where we actually, um, they're probably about 60, 70 years old and they were my mother's and then I got to wear them probably about 40 years ago. So um, it's kind of been in the family and uh, we wore those when we were, um, there were dances like a long festival, the Japanese festival. And so they were in California because that's where my parents were raised. And so we would wear those during those, those festivals. Very nice. Thank you for bringing those. Yes, very nice. Okay, so I just wanted to share with you the beautiful culture of the Japanese yukata, the summer kimono. The tip about wearing a yukata or any kimono is that you always put the left over the right because the way Americans do it, we would normally put the right over the left, and that's only reserved for corpses. Make a, um, a radial fan design. That's what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to look like a fan. And uh, normally I would say my favorite um, material would be the flax, but we didn't have enough, and so we substituted for the layatris, which actually looked beautiful with the yellow Gerber daisy. So um, it's supposed to look like a fan, a folding fan open, right? So when you place them, I want you to lay them. It's the reason I only have, a, try to have two of you at a table because you need more space and uh, you need room to, to lay these out. But what I'm, we're not gonna cut it based on the container necessarily. We're gonna cut it based on the shape of the layatris. So you want to analyze, like this one's bigger and this one's tinier. So you're gonna put the biggest, strongest one in the center. Then you're going to put the next two biggest ones on either side at the same height. Then you're gonna stagger down. The next two will be a little shorter. And the last two, which are smaller, right like that. Then we're just simply going to cut, um, but when I get them all together, there we go. Then I'm just simply going to cut them straight across. If we were doing flax, I would do the same thing. But then when you go to angle your pieces, you would cut it in an angle so that it will bend, it will go that way in the, in the Kenzon. All right, so we don't have that. Now we've got a circular, and so we're normally we start in the back two thirds of our Kenzon, but not today. In the radial form, we're going to put the straightest, tallest, biggest one in the center of our Kenzon, straight up and down. Then we're going to take the ones on the right side and we're going to have those go to the back. So in your Kenzon, you're actually going to create um, a 45 degree angle diagonally and you're going to put each stem next to the other, one behind the other. So you can do all the back ones uh, first if you want, and then do all the front, or you can you know, go right, left, right, left, front, back, whichever, one, whichever way you wanna do it is fine. And we just place those in to the Kenzon and spread them apart just like a fan. And then we're gonna do the front and I'm gonna place them each in front of the center one. Now these all represent the heaven line this time. Normally, um, we only have the main branch as our heaven line, but in this case, all of these are heaven, and we have seven of them, which is in, in biblical terminology, seven is the number of perfection or completion. So we're gonna have all, and I'm gonna take off all the foliage up to a certain point, so they, so it actually looks like a fan, you know how when the, when you unfold the fan, it has a little like an arc in it. So you're gonna do get that same look by stripping off the foliage and the leaves so that you have that little arc kind of going on. And then finally, this last one here on the side. Like 
like so. Okay, once you get that in, we're going to use Gerber daisies, and aren't they beautiful? Mm -hmm. But you're going to lay them out on the table and you're gonna look to see which one is bigger. Now, sometimes, you know, they all look pretty close, but you can kind of look and see which one is the most open, which one is has the biggest, heaviest stem. That can all be determining factors in which one is the tallest. And today, I actually need to have a taller one for my man line. I want it to be three-fourths the height of that. So three-fourths the height of this is right, really, kind of right there. So I'm just going to give it a fresh cut. And then I have these little wires. They are called Gerber wire supports. And they're only used for stems that are uh, solid and don't have any leaves or anything to disrupt you using them. But it has a, like a little spike at the top and then a little bump underneath and then it goes straight and then it's a spring or a coil. So you're gonna slide it up from the bottom. Some florists use giant straws to help hold this, the stem but you're actually going to impale the neck of the, the flower right here with the wire, and you're gonna push it up through there uh, until, it, until the little bump reaches underneath the calyx, and then you're going to slide the wire. I know, aren't they great? Yeah. Very nice, you're gonna slide that down, and that'll help support your, um, your flower. Now, I'm going to place this behind the second and the third uh, rib, of my fan and I'm gonna put it, the stem is placed from the back side, but the flower looks to the front because we want these to actually look like they're painted on the fan. It's supposed to look like a fan that's been painted. So now we're gonna use, I'm just gonna give it a fresh cut. I'm going to again use these little wires, slide it up right underneath the neck of the Gerber where the little bump comes out, I'm going to hold it with my thumb and forefinger so that then I can slide this wire down the stem. And then I'm going to place the next one right there. Then I'm going to take another one and I'm going to make it shorter. I would have preferred to have one a little bit higher, but I want my smaller one to be a little bit lower. So I'm going to turn it upside down. I'm going to measure it to there. I'm going to cut it. I'm going to put my wire on it. And again, um, kind of spear it right underneath the head and then pull the wire down just like that. So where do you get the wires? Uh, you have to go to your florist to get it. Um, they, I, I get them at the wholesaler, but you can get them from a floral, floral shop or I'll sell you some if you want some extra ones. What are they called? They're called Gerber Daisy Wire Supports. <laughs> <laughs> Real technical, yes. So that's what they use them for. I think you could probably use them for tulips if the stems weren't too fat in the, in the, uh, in the tulip. Then once you have your Gerber daisies done, then um, because, I, because I have these and they're kind of spread out, they're not as, a flax is more broad and flat and gives me a, a canvas to paint on. Because of that, I'm actually gonna make one of these a little bit higher than I would normally. I'm gonna take all the lower leaves off. I'm gonna select the biggest one, which I think is this one. I'm gonna place it up between here, and I'm gonna make another triangle of these kind of down lower, but between um, these flowers on the opposite side. So I'm gonna cut this here. Then I'm gonna work all these stems into the front part of the design, like so. Then to measure the next one, I'm gonna take the next biggest one, which is this one. Are gonna these also part of man? Uh, no, these are actually part of earth. Uh -huh. So they should be lower, but because of my design and my, I don't have flax now, I've got these. I'm going to uh, make these, this one was higher, but the rest will all be lower. So that's a good question, really. that's a great question. So now I'm gonna cut these so I get three different, again, three different lengths. and I'm gonna make a triangle out of these three. And then I'm gonna pull one forward because um, this is dimensionally sculptural. I'm gonna pull off the bottom foliage, but leave some of the nice leaves on there and then just make another. So I have a triangle here and I, I excuse me, another triangle here with the, with the berries. 
all right? But the reason I made this one higher was because this, this one could have been higher and then these could have been lower, but um, Shikataganai, as they say, can't be helped. It is what it is. Now I'm going to use the Ming Fern. Now Ming Fern has a tendency to, the little uh, needles will kind of fall like Christmas tree needles when they're, you know, like your tree dries out and the little needles will fall. But to keep it lasting longer, uh, when you, once you put it in here, I would say every day, I know it's a lot, a lot of maintenance, but every day go and take it out, um, get, uh, mist it with a flower mister or mist it in the sink and then give it a fresh cut and then put it back in there. And it should last longer because you're hydrating it. All right, so now I'm gonna give it a cut and I'm gonna cut off all of the, the, the stems, the pieces. Be careful, it has little thorns on it that are lower that would touch my bowl because I don't want any uh, anything to touch my bowl as I cascade down. I'm gonna take this last one off. Then I'm going to angle this. I'm going to work it in, put it in the Kenzan and pull it forward slightly, just like that. Then I'm gonna take this last piece and it's going to go in the back. And because this fan is more uh, see-through, uh, you still get to enjoy some of these um, green from behind. And I'm gonna put this in so that it's nestled up a little bit against the fan, but yet comes out the back to give me more depth in my arrangement. Yeah, I want it a little bit shorter. So right there, and then I'm gonna cut off that last one. Because you don't want nothing to touch the bowl, nothing in the water, no foliage in the water. And then to add that into the back. And then you can kind of play with the, the branches a little bit to try to get them to go in the direction you want. But that is the design for today. So it's a radial uh, fan for the summer. So you can enjoy that with your wearing your nice fresh yukata. Okay. <laughs> just get let me just grab right. a flap here or a couple flaps here. So you can see if you ever do this again on your own and you should have flax. Oh wow. Um, yeah, so here's some tips. Um, so Linda, would you grab a, a, a tape um, scotch tape off the table? Yep. And the scissors. Actually grab a different scissors, that's a bad scissors, sorry. <laughs> I know, right? Oh dear. All right, so if you have flax, and they're not all perfect, okay? Oh, thank you, perfect. All right, I know this is somebody's, so yeah, thank you. All right, if you don't mind, I'm gonna borrow oh, no. one. Okay, so if you have flax, and let's say, uh, do I have any here that has a split in it? Yes. If it's a, if it's a big split like that, you can take scotch tape um, and make sure your hands are dry and just tape over and rub it onto the back side and that will secure it so that now it won't it won't continue to split on you now a lot of times when you get flax sometimes it'll be brown at the top and they still want to sell their product and so they'll they'll cut it off at a funny angle and it's not really natural looking so if you have a little piece like that you can just take it off and then you take your scissors and you simply cut it flat, then you use the vein in the center and you actually cut a nice slim point to make it look like a real flax that's healthy, that's growing, and voila, you have a nice spear-shaped flax, which, which looks good, right? So that's what you wanna do if you have a flax. Again, see if it's brown or it's splitting, you can cut it here then you can turn it around, see where the little vein is in the center, and then cut it down on each side. Don't make, don't make a real sharp angle, but make a nice graduated angle like that. And then that will make a nice fan like the drawing. And you wanna put the biggest one in the middle and then fan it out to the smaller ones on the edge, okay?